Welcome to worship online today with the Lutheran Church of Del Rapids. I'm Pastor Jeff Sorensen, and Pastor Eldon Thero will be assisting with worship as well as our worship team and lots of people helping to help this come to you. We're celebrating today, uh, this Sunday morning in our first service, we have two of our children being baptized, Palmer Langer and Conrad Reinhardt, and we celebrate with their families at this beginning of their faith lives among us. We also, at our later service today, are having affirmation of faith for 24 of our 10th grade uh, young men and women. That'll be in the city park, and a great celebration as a congregation with families and friends and mentors and teachers and sponsors and parents and all uh, with these wonderful young men and women affirming their faith. Please join us in worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us give thanks for our baptism. Blessed are you, holy God. You are the creator of the waters of the earth. You are the fire of rebirth. You poured out your spirit on your people Israel. You breathe life into our dry bones. Your son, Jesus, pr promised to send the Spirit to us that the world may know your love. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Breathe new life into all who are baptized. Empower our witness to your love that all may know your unfailing grace and mercy through your son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you Should your life attract or scare, will you let me answer prayer in you and you in me? Will you sound in you and you in me. Lord, your summons echoes true in you, but call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go where your Step show, thus I'll move and live and grow in you and you in me. Let us pray. Merciful God, lead us in your truth, instruct us in your ways, remember us according to your steadfast love. In your goodness, give us the humility we need to wait upon you. Amen. Sometimes it seems that the more time we spend with Scripture, doesn't it seem to be more 
that's inconsistent with itself, contradictory, where it says one thing and then on the other hand it says something completely opposite, which can leave us confused and wondering like, huh, what's with that? And then we find something else comes along as we study scripture and we find, oh, this makes perfect sense of that. Well, that's the case with Psalm 25, a psalm, um, a song, a poem written by King David of Israel in the midst of his failures and his struggles that he faced along life's way and I think is helpful for us today. We hear in 1 Samuel of the prophet Samuel being sent by God to find a new king for Israel and the choosing and anointing of King David. Now earlier at God's instruction, the prophet Samuel had anointed a man named Saul as David's, as Israel's first king. After the people of Israel escaped slavery in Egypt, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and then they went to battle against Canaanites who were inhabiting the land. And there was a warrior leading in those battles, um, taller, stronger than any other man whose name was Saul. And this Saul, God chose as the first king of Israel, and Samuel anointed him. But when Saul became king, he turned against God. Saul, with this kind of new power and authority, became full of himself. Arrogant, cruel, he was selfish. He even led the people and demanded that they make a statue of himself on a mountain to worship himself there rather than God. So Saul failed. He failed to lead Israel as God commanded. And so God now told Samuel that God would take that kingship away from him. He had to be taken down and replaced with another new king. Saul reminds me, a humorous story from my senior year in high school football. We had a quarterback who was just plumb full of himself. Arrogant, rude to everyone. Until one day in practice, the O-line had had their fill of him. And after practice, when the coach went on up to the locker room and instructed the captains to lead us in drills to close out the practice, the O-line took the quarterback down on the 50-yard line and de-pantsed him and left him there just maybe a little less full of himself, not much, than he had been before. Well, back to Saul. God said, I regret that I have made Saul to be king. He needs being taken down. He needs replacing. So he sent Samuel to find another king while Saul still was king. But who would that be? So God sent the prophet to Jesse of Bethlehem with instructions to choose from among his sons. So Jesse brought out ten of his sons, big, strong, strapping young men, mighty warriors, all ten of them. But as each one of them in order stepped up for Samuel, God said to the prophet, no, I have not chosen this one, no. I've rejected him, God said. He said, don't look on his stature, for the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look, mortals, at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We people look at outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So the story goes on after those ten older sons. They now sent for the boy, the youngest son, David. The young son who Jesse had not called in. He was out caring for the family sheep. And God looked at this boy, David, and said to the prophet, this is the one, anoint him. For, quote, and this is from, uh, from the Samuel, says, this is the one for, quote, now he was ruddy, meaning he had red hair, and then he had beautiful eyes and was handsome which has always struck me as a bit of contradiction. Of, huh? What? God says, don't look at the outward appearance, but instead the heart, and then tell Samuel to choose this young one who had 
beautiful eyes and was handsome. Well, then, as the story of David unfolds, and he grows, and he eventually becomes king in place of Saul, in time, he too, as king, the one with beautiful eyes and is handsome, becomes full of himself, and he too fails. When David's armies conquer Jerusalem and decide to make Jerusalem their capital city, he built a palace, and he brings in the Ark of the Covenant into the city, and then David the king leads a procession in celebration of what he himself has done, dancing naked in the streets. And he has to be taken down a peg by a daughter who also sees this and is humiliated. And again later, when David is looking down from his palace at a woman, Bathsheba, bathing in her home below, he calls her to him makes her pregnant, and then sends her husband Uriah to the front of the battle to be killed so that he, David, the king, the powerful one, can marry her. The prophet Nathan calls him to account for his sin. At which David, who is so full of himself, first responds in just anger. And then in time. In time, he confesses, He's contrite, he humbles himself, he seeks redemption, and pledges now to serve God in God's way, in his way, instead of first himself, and rules and leads God's people in God's way. So what does it mean to be so full of ourselves that living in God's way, in his way, fails? And what do we learn from King David about finding our way through our failures to living and serving as God intends in God's way instead? First of all this, that we are made in the image of God. We hear from the creation stories, God says, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, meaning The presence of God, the full presence of God, the the image of God is in us. The presence of God is part of us. God's presence, but along with also the presence of evil in us as we learn from those same creation stories. Martin Luther called that simul justus et peccator in the Latin, which means that we're simultaneously at the same time saint, the presence of God in us, but also sinner, that, that sin also is present in us. But sometimes we forget that. Sometimes our self, our pride in ourself, our I'm number one in life gets so big that we literally get so full of only ourselves that we squeeze out the space in our hearts where God lives. And God's presence, God's way in our lives becomes so small, so minimized, so overwhelmed by instead the me, that like Saul, we build statues to ourselves. Like David, we lead celebrations of ourselves and use other people to please ourselves. Like my arrogant high school quarterback, we forget that the O-line may be important sometimes, more important than the quarterback. Sometimes, like all of us, at some point, we're the center of our universe. And for us, it's no matter that we're called to love and serve one another, which is God's way instead for our lives. Saul never did find his way back, but David did. And he became a great king of Israel. He became the author of these psalms, the songs of David, that we still today look to and find inspiration from as expressions of a healthy and God-filled life of faith. So how did David find his way back when he had failed? Psalm 25, written by David, It's written in the midst of his struggle to return as he seeks to fill his life again with the presence of God and not just himself. So I'm going to read to you as we close Psalm 25, 1 to 9, 
with some commentary about what's happening in David's struggle of faith. It begins, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. To you, O Lord. O my God, says David, in you I trust. Do not let me, he says, continue to be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. He says, don't let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be in shame instead who are wantonly treacherous. Says David, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me, O Lord, your paths. Lead me, says David, in your truth. And teach me, for you are the God of my salvation, for you are. I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, says David, as as one who has failed, as one who is so desperately now in need of God's mercy, he pleads, be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love never failing me as you have been from of old. Says David, in the midst of his struggle, so full of himself that he's failed, he says, do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. He says, when I got so full of myself, of my beautiful eyes and my handsome appearance and my power as king, he says, but according to your steadfast love, O God, that remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. He concludes, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. God leads the humble in what is right. God teaches the humble his way. God teaches the humble his way. This is the story. This is the song. This is the plea of King David who has been humbled who now pleads with God to fill his life instead, not full only of himself, but full of instruction, full of God's leading to teach him God's ways, his ways instead. This is the call of God. Today, two children are baptized in their congregation. It's the call of God and it's the promise of of parents and sponsors and family of our children to be filled with the presence of God for their lives and that we promise even as a whole congregation to give them instruction, to help lead them, to teach them in God's ways. This also is what we celebrate today as we have 24 of our young men and women that, that they, and, and as I'll preach when I, when I got these kids in front of me, you are affirming that parents and sponsors and teachers and guides and mentors and along the way have done that on behalf of God and in the voice of God and with the love of God have instructed and have led and have taught you in God's ways. And that each of them and you have been humble enough, the saint in you, the faith in you, to find your life redeemed and changed by this life of faith, as was David. To be able to claim today, continue, O God, to lead us, we pray, in your way, in your way. Amen. My soul cries out with a joyful shout that the God of my heart is great. And my spirit sings of the wondrous things that you bring to the ones who wait. You fixed your sight on your servant's plight, and my weakness you did not spurn. So from east to west shall my name be blessed, could the world be about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. 
Though I am small, my God, my all, you work great things in me. And your mercy will last from the depths of the past to the end of the age to be. Your very name puts the proud to shame and to those who would for you yearn. You will show your might, put the strong to flight, for the world is about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near and the world is about to turn. From the halls of power to the fortress tower, not a stone will be left on stone. Let the king beware, for your justice tears every tyrant from his throne. The hungry poor shall weep no more for the food they can never earn. There are tables spread, every mouth be fed, for the world is about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, but the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. Though nations rage from age to age, we remember who holds us fast. God's mercy must deliver us from the conqueror's crushing grasp. This saving word that our forebears heard is the promise which holds us bound. Till the spear and rod can be crushed by God who is turning the world around. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, the world is about to turn. With the whole church, let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Join us, please, in the prayers of God's people. We pray. Lord God, you created us in your image. You filled us with your presence in the water and word of baptism. And yet, O oh God, we turn from you and we turn from your ways full instead of ourselves rather than reflecting you. And so we pray, teach us your ways. We pray, give us the humility that we need to wait instead upon you. Lord, we pray for your mercy upon the needs of the people of our community of faith. Those that we've named in our worship folder as they've risen among us today. Those, oh God, that we name quietly in our hearts before you. Where our people are ill, where they're struggling, where they're grieving, oh God, bring your mercy.
And we pray, oh God, especially today in great celebration, as 24 of our 10th grade youth affirm their faith, and as Palmer Langer and Conrad Reinhardt are baptized in faith, oh God, today is a great celebration here among your people. We give you thanks. And we pray, oh God, for our partners in ministry that you've given us the privilege of serving with. For the banquet in Church on the Street and the St. Dismas Prison Congregation in Sioux Falls. For the Pine Ridge and Two Strike Ministries in South Dakota. For the Lutheran Church of Faith and Hope in Nicaragua. For all of the work of the people of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, we give you thanks. Pray that through what we do in your name, that we glorify your name among us. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. this time, if we were gathered together here in the sanctuary, we would be receiving the offering. We, of course, will not be doing that at this point, but we encourage you to continue to send in uh, your offerings and, or bring them in and put them in the bo box in the narthex. Uh, we want to thank you for the way that you have continued to support the ministry of this congregation so generously. Thank you again. Now at this time, if you are prepared to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion, you have the words of institution there with you, you can now at this point pause the recording and then receive and share the sacrament of Holy Communion with your family. We pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. One, two, three, four, one. A mighty fortress is our God. Sword and shield victorious. He breaks the cruel oppressor's rod and wins salvation glorious. The old satanic foe has sworn to work us war with craft and dreadful himself to fight. On earth he has no equal. No strength of ours can match his might. We would be lost, rejected. But now a champion comes to fight, whom God himself elects. Son adore, he holds the feet. 
must prevail one little word subdues him God's word forever shall abide no thanks to foes who fear it for God himself fights by our side with weapons of the spirit they to take our house, good honor, child or spouse, though life be wrenched away, they cannot win the day. The kingdom's ours forever. As we conclude our worship, go in peace, walk in his way, and live.